Hi, everyone, and warmly welcome to today's uh, webinar on uh, managing grid integration of electric vehicles. My name is uh, Per Anders Vidal, and I'm responsible for EA's support to the Global e Mobility Program. Uh, before I hand over to uh, Alejandro Hernandez for opening our remarks, I just want to let you know that the event today will be recorded. Uh, there's a st very strong interest for this topic, which is why we also want to make it, uh, the event available on the IA website. So it's now, now my pleasure uh, to hand it over to Alejandro Hernandez for the opening remarks. Alejandro is the head of the IA's uh, Renewable uh, Integration and Secure Electricity Unit. Uh, Alejandro, over to you. Thanks so much, Per. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this IA webinar on managing grid integration of electric vehicles. This webinar is held by the IEA on their Global Electricity Mobility Program, funded by the Global Environmental Facility, or GEF, to support countries in their shift to electri electric mobility. Uh, as a bit of a background, this program was launched during COP26 in Glasgow and aims to support ele electric mobility projects in over 30 low and middle income countries worldwide. The program includes four global thematic working groups, which gather country representatives, experts from the industry and from academia, international organizations, and all with that with the aim to deliver knowledge materials and tools and establish a network for global advocacy, technology, and policy advice to support electric mobility. The IEA is happy to coordinate two of the four working groups, and today's webinar falls under the thematic working group on EV charging, grid integration, and batteries. This is the second webinar, actually, that we have in this series. Our first webinar took place in December the 8th and focused on rollout the strategies for public charging infrastructure. Its recording is available on the IEA events webpage. Today, we will look at the issue of integrating electric vehicles into the grid. As we all know, power systems around the world are undergoing a large amount of a process of transformation. System operations, electricity market design, and long-term planning are adapting to accommodate more variable renewable energy, like wind and solar, taking advantage of uh, new technologies to achieve the compensation objectives. This transformation journey just has just started. Power systems will continue to play a key role to support the electrification of road transport, as well as other end uses. In the IEA net zero by 2050 scenario, there will be 2 billion electric vehicles on the road, compared to around 11 million today and charging them can impact the electricity system, both uh, at the system level and the local grid uh, level. Furthermore, it could, it could have also very important uh, impacts at level of emissions. And several studies have already seen our potential consequences for the power system. If two out of three cars in the USA were electric by 2050, that means about, around 180 million electric vehicles, the peak demand could grow as much as 32% compared to a business as usual. In China, on managed charging of 30, 350 million electric vehicles by 2050, will entail a peak load increase by 12.5% and system cost increase by 10%. For the local distribution system, a service area in California would need to upgrade five more times uh, compared to original plan uh, to accommodate EVs by 2030. So there are challenges, but of course there are also many opportunities for the power systems. We could take advantage of the EV's potential flexibility. EV charging can be managed to smoothen its integration into, into grids, support integration of variable renewals, and increase the system resilience. In the European Union, for instance, between 14% and 27% of power generation cost savings could be achieved by 2030 if charging is managed through time of use and real-time pricing. VR equipment could also be reduced by 14% by leveraging uh, EV flexibility. In France, where the power system is robust enough to handle the increase in EVs by 2050, smart charging can free up to from six to 13 gigawatts of capacity uh, compared to unmanaged charging. For synergies to be maximized though, the power sector stakeholders will need to understand better the demand from mobility. And likewise, the transport sector to understand the power system objectives and constraints. Accelerating transport electrification requires us to break silos and to cooperate across sectors. 
I'm very happy to welcome today's speakers who will share their expertise in integrating electric vehicles into the grid. We will hear about what aspects that countries need to consider to integrate electric vehicles into the grid. Experience from real-time deployment of managed charging and offer perspec the perspectives from various stakeholders. During our panel session, we will also explore how these insights from various countries can help low and medium income economies. The IEA will gather the learnings from this webinar to inform its policy manual on assessing the impact of EV charging, managing the integration of electric vehicles and leveraging their benefits to the grid. So without further ado, I will pass back the floor to Per and I'm looking forward to great discussions. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for those excellent uh, opening remarks. And with further ado, we're going to go straight to our uh, distinguished panelists. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Cristina Corchero, Monica Ternay, Krista Scotland, and Shamasis Das here with us today uh, to provide us with more of insights and input to the work we, 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 we are doing on, on this topic. Uh, each presenter will have 10 minutes, which will be followed by a Q&A um, led by my colleague Luis Lopez. Uh, five minutes and as some of you already done um, please use the chat function uh, the QA function uh, if you have any uh, questions to the to the to the presenters uh, with that I will uh, hand it over to uh, Luis uh, to kick off the discussion and the presentations over to you Luis um Thank you so much, Per. My name is Luis. I'm an analyst for the Renewables Integration Secure Electricity Unit of the IEA. I'll be moderating the presentation and panel session today. And as Per mentioned, I invite the audience member to ask questions on the Q&A function of Zoom. Today, we are joined by an amazing set of speakers who will share their perspective and expertise in the topic of grid integration of electric vehicles. And by the end, we hope to have answered the following questions. What are the impacts of EV charging? What's the potential to manage them? What can we learn from real world deployment of measures? And what set of measures should policymakers prioritize to ensure a successful integration of EVs? I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Cristina Corchero. Cristina is a Sarah Hunter professor in the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, the head of energy systems analytics research group in the Energy Research Institute of Catalonia. She also founded Bamboo Energy, a spin-off company based on her research on flexibility and demand aggregation. She serves as the operating agent for the task on vehicle grid integration in the IEA's hybrid and electric vehicle technology collaboration platform. So to share her expertise, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luis. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation today. <clears throat> I'm very glad to be here uh, to share with you some of the insights that we have gathered during the last years in the uh, working group that Luis has just mentioned on the technological collaboration program on hybrid and electric vehicle and on the task, the one that we finished on uh, vehicle to grid and the one that is ongoing on vehicle with integration. So just we will start with analyzing a little bit uh, why we're worried about this vehicle with integration. Um, I typically come from the energy side, but we work on the transport side. And this is just the intersection of both sides. And this is one of the key messages that we will uh, gather today, or I hope that we gather today from my presentation, is that we should join forces from the energy and the transport to uh, optimize and to enable a uh, soft and, um, and a feasible vehicle with integration for all. The idea that we have is that if we um, obtain or if we arrive to the electric vehicle presentation that we aim to without controlling the charging of these electric vehicles, this would be unfeasible for the grids, as has been mentioned just a few minutes ago. So we have two perspectives in front of us. So we know that uh, the smart charging of these electric vehicles is crucial. Let's say it's mandatory. And we also have uh, in the next future, another technology that is arising that is the vehicle to grid. 
So we would like to uh, point out that the smart charging is crucial. So it's necessary, vehicle to grid would be powerful. The electric vehicles, we should see them as controllable loads. We should see them as a tool for smoothing the demand peaks. They can act, and we will go later to this on our policy recommendations as distributed storage. So we should see them as a distributed energy resource. And the idea is that the EV drivers, and we will see that the users is the other pillar of our work, uh, should earn rewards or should at least decrease the total cost of energy of their electric vehicle thanks to their participation to their active charging of their electric vehicles. So what are we what are we talking about? Uh, when we see smart charge, we th we should uh, focus on three main things. We need three things for making smart charge real, which is obviously smart infrastructure. So um, it is necessary to learn that is uh, no longer. Um, is no longer feasible to install, let's say, dummy chargers. We need smart infrastructure on the field. We also need, obviously, smart technology that is able to manage this smart infrastructure to take into account this necessity, necessity sorry, from the grid. But last but not least, we need smart pricing, which is typically on the policy side. We need a smart pricing to get the signal so that the electric vehicle charging process goes and helps the system. On the other side, when we say that vehicle to grid is powerful, this is only the insight I will get you to vehicle to grid, but the idea is that we will use the cars as distributed batteries, distributed energy storage. Uh, here there appears a lot of different and new business models uh, where the vehicles can provide energy to the buildings, to the houses, but also to the grid. So they are acting as a distributed energy resource and uh, new, new agents, as we know, arise to the energy markets like the aggregators that typically manage this flexibility that the vehicles give to us. So uh, why we should focus on a smart charge? Typically we think on a building and on a house, but it's not only there where we need it. The uh, public and semi-public infrastructure should be also smart because the impact of the energy grid will occur in at every location of an EV charger. So we should focus on urban uh, solutions there where there is not a private parking, where the users will go to public charging, where there are supermarkets, uh, hotels, or other um, offices where the EV charges are being installed. There is also smart charge needed. Obviously, in rural areas where uh, there are not private parkings or there are public parkings for the electric vehicles. And also in the highways. So if we installed um, fast and ultra fast uh, electric vehicle charges, which should take into account the necessities and the impact on the grid. So just to uh, mention a few references on vehicle to grid, you can uh, check there is an amazing work done by the colleagues in the UK, where you can have a look to, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, spring <laughs> in Spain. Uh, you can have a look to uh, the ongoing vehicle to grid uh, projects around the world and main important thing, the lessons learned from them. So there are many insights there to those that are interested to see how they are working and which are the uh, business models and the uh, opportunities that arise. On the right side is just only an example of a vehicle to grid installation where you can see that uh, the, the cost for the owner decrease on between 10 and 15% and we increase the renewable energy uh, consumption also between eight and 10%. So there are impacts for having this uh, charge on our side. And I was speaking about this. So the important thing is to sit together. So who should sit together when talking about vehicle grid integration? We should have energy we should have distributing system operators, we should have energy suppliers, TSOs, 
We should have automotive sectors, so obviously vehicle manufacturers and so on, but mainly charging point operators, parking operators, and we cannot forget about the users. We need the users involved uh, when designing and implementing all these policies because they will be the last um, resource. So they are the ones that will enable this smart charge from our vehicles. So they should be engaged and they need some warranties on their side. So some lessons learned from our work. Uh, we have identified these four pillars, hardware and software, standards and regulation, business models and users. If we start from hardware and software, which are the challenges that we have on the field? We have different power electronic requirements uh, between different countries. So this is something that we still need to work on. Obviously, when we move, and we will see this also in a standard and regulation on protocols and communication requirements. So there are some standards that are being developed that should be uh, used and should be developed to enable this smart charge and to easy this smart charge. And obviously, one important thing is data management, not only in, in terms of management, but that data privacy is very important and it's a, it's a um, critical point also for the users all around cybersecurity. And all this should be also taken into account when developing and implementing hardware and software solutions for, for EV chargers. When we move to standard regulations, we have issues or we have challenges in front of us because there are different international electricity market regulations, obviously grid regulations. So we should analyze carefully, which is the uh, framework where we are working on and which are the challenges and the opportunities that arises in this framework. Regarding the business models, uh, we are still on a ticket and X situation. So the idea is that there are some countries where this uh, market is obviously more, uh, it's already developed, uh, where this situation has been, has been solved. But in all others, uh, we have still this situation where not enough investments are done, but then not enough users are there. And then we are like uh, going and going around. Uh, we need regulation to push this to push these business models and to enable um, new interactions between all these actors that we have already uh, discussed. And as I said, uh, last but one of the most important pillars is the users. So we need um, clear and transparent messages for the users that really understand why the smart charge is necessary, why the smart charge is crucial for the system and also which are the benefits for the user. The, uh, the uh, total cost of ownership should be clearly decreased. So I cannot pay more because of this smart charge because then I will get uh, users that are not engaged, that are not willing to participate on this, on this, um, on this charge. Also obviously warranties and uh, clear and transparent identification of the revenues, the benefits and the stakeholders involved in all this process. So to finish, um, the policy recommendations, those are already discussed and you can, you can see them more developed in the, in the reports of a website of the, of the IA task. But uh, just to summarize, so the first thing is that we, sh we should define the electric vehicle as a distributed energy resource. That might be simple or might be uh, kind of a strange uh, message, but at the end, this is implicit in all market regulations. So in the, in the energy markets, there are some um, agents and actors that are enabled to participate. And in many of them, electric vehicles are not identified as one of the actors that can participate. And that, uh, provide, that, that um, makes it possible to take benefits of some of the new market opportunities that are arising. Um, then we need uh, the movements on the building side. So we need the buildings to be prepared and there are many international policies that already are putting in place that new buildings should mandatory have this smart charge installed and buildings that are, um, that are uh, renewed also should have already prepared for these users that aim to uh, install these, uh, these chargers. 
Also the pricing, pricing is one of the main important pillars for this. So uh, we need that there are smart tariff designs this uh, means not only on energy use, but also on network services. So we should implement tariffs that represents the needs from the grid. And this might be dynamic, might be different for different areas in, in a country or different uh, necessities of the grid. And this should be implemented from the uh, energy regulation side. And last but not least is the smart charging technology. Obviously, there are many, many, many um, solutions right now around the world. There are many solutions for smart charging, uh, but they should be deployed and they should be deployed in the um, way that the country or the region needs them. And it's important also to analyze the funding or the taxing schemas that are put in place to promote these uh, new installations and to promote that these installations are smart enough to enable uh, smart charge or even vehicle to grid. So with this, I thank you again for the uh, opportunity and open to any questions on the questions and answer section. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Um, there's a couple of questions and I would like to condense them uh, together into, um, into this. So we've seen some um, in the, in one of your slides, we've seen how um, there were, you've showed how there are several pilot studies of V2G in, um, in Europe and in the US as, uh, um, as well, including the ones in the UK. So would you be able to comment on any one of them specifically in terms of um, the actual energy that it was uh, they were able to provide and were there any negative impacts on the grid? Yes, so uh, well, from the projects that I have analyzed, uh, they have been uh, able to provide uh, services to the grid. I know some of them working, as you said, on the States, on UK, and on other countries of Europe, for instance, in the uh, Netherlands, in Denmark, they have, they have shown that they are, they are able to aggregate uh, a set of vehicle to grid chargers and behave as, a, let's say, one unique uh, uh, power provider, okay, to provide typically ancillary services to the market and to the grid, and already working. They have analyzed uh, the business model because this is one of the pillars at the end. If we cannot uh, make a business model that works, uh, the, 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 it never will go one step further, the demonstration project, let's say. And uh, some of them already have very interesting numbers. Uh, some of them are public. I can commend them. For instance, in the Denmark, uh, they have shown that uh, you can, uh, one, I, I remember that it was 120 euros per EV per month, for instance. So there are uh, some knowledge already on the on the even on the uh, benefits that you can gather from it, and there was not impact on the grid, but it is shown that uh, in specifically in some regions of the UK, this activity is uh, allowing the uh, and it's not the DSO there is the DNO, but uh, at the end the distribution the distribution system operator to um, delay the investment on the grid because they are using this vehicle to grid to alleviate some grid issues that uh, were already in place. So what they are showing is that they can delay or even avoid this uh, grid investment, let's say, uh, by means of integrating smart charge or even vehicle to grid. Thanks very much, uh, Christina. I, uh, I would like to highlight the, the two things that you mentioned that uh, in the Danish study, it was 120 yes. euros per EV per month. So that's quite, um, uh, that's a really interesting uh, figure. And then uh, how in the UK that they were able to delay in yes. infrastructure because of um, the DNO's activities on this. Um, perhaps we have one um, one final question before we move on to the next presenter. Um, how do you see ride hailing um, as part of smart infrastructure? So, yeah. <laughs> we have, I, I have not, uh, I have not analyzed it as deep as uh, the others. So I, so I don't have a particular, let's say, uh, answer to this. 
but I'm sure that uh, we can, uh, yeah, we can look for it and uh, analyze it better to give you an answer. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Thank Christina. You, um, we now move on to our next speaker. Um, as Christina mentioned earlier, one of the main important things in, in enabling B2G is warranties with um, battery manufacturers and OEMs. We have our next speaker, uh, Monica Dernay. Monica is the team lead of sustainability and mobility in BMW Group. And she has been with the group since 2007 and has taken on various roles, including urban mobility and BMW's electric fleet. Today, she brings us a unique perspective of the OEM and sharing some insights of BMW's managed charging pilot, um, the Charge Forward program in California. So without any further ado, Monica, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I want to give you a quick overview of our uh, managed charging pilot in the US. And uh, what I want to do first is uh, give you a little bit of a background of why BMW is actually looking at the managed charging topic. Um, we as a manufacturer have a very big focus of, on sustainability. So we are the first German car maker to join the business ambition for 1.5 degrees Celsius. That means we are committed to uh, stop global warming and reduce our CO2 emissions. And what that means is we have set ourselves very ambitious uh, goals over the life cycle of our vehicles. Now, I want to uh, lend, uh, um, uh, show you the, especially the use phase topic. Um, use phase meaning we are looking at uh, reducing the CO2 emissions of our customers while they own the vehicle. Now for us as a manufacturer, it seems pretty uh, straightforward. If you substitute a combustion engine vehicle uh, with a uh, electric vehicle, uh, that already reduces your emissions uh, by a lot since the um, uh, combustion engine um, emits most of its uh, emissions in the use phase, around 80% of its emissions in the use phase, phase actually. Um, so uh, we have electrified a large part of our fleet, but with that obviously come questions. Uh, and some of them are questions that are directed towards us as a manufacturer. And some of them are directed to obviously grid operators, but they in turn look to us to maybe help them help so help help them solve their problems. And uh, so what we did is uh, we looked at uh, two issues. One of them is: Do we have enough energy for all the uh, electric vehicles on the street? And the second problem is: uh, Do they? use uh, renewable energy because if they just use coal generated energy they still emit uh, basically uh, co2 just in different uh, ways so um, we looked at the um, uh, german energy market and the german vehicle fleet and uh, we saw that in terms of renewable energy in the grid, we really have enough to, sub to um, if we substituted all cars with electric cars, all cars that are driving around in Germany, we would have enough renewable energy in the grid in terms of amount of energy. Uh, but obviously it's not available at the uh, time that people are charging. So that's the chart that Christina already showed that I'm going to go to in a moment. And the second topic is the amount of energy in the grid. And uh, we also looked at that and saw that there is a lot of uh, enough energy in the grid. Uh, the main problem are peak times. And I think this is the chart that uh, I think everybody of us has this chart in, in their presentation in some ways, because this is the main problem issue uh, why we look at uh, uh, steered charging. Um, because the renewable share is available in the middle of the day and people uh, uh, usually charge their vehicle in the morning or in the evening. The Americans call this uh, the duck curve. So uh, we looked at uh, a way of moving the charging events to the uh, first of all non-peak times and also we looked at a way to moving this uh, towards the uh, more renewable um, availability of, of energy. So um, 
the charge forward program looked at uh, something called load shifting so they are only shifting the charging events like christina mentioned uh, when once we move into vehicle to grid we could also decharge the vehicle but this at this moment this pilot is only looking at the uh, shifting uh, events and that uh, obviously helps better if you have uh, also tariffs supporting it like Christina said um, because then uh, customers are much more inclined to actually um, agree to these programs. So what did we do? We partnered with a utility in the US, uh, PG&E. Uh, and first of all, we, we had a pilot uh, with 400 uh, customers, and then uh, we've been actually rolling it out since uh, with several utilities across uh, the US. Um, and uh, how does it work? Uh, I will show you the customer journey in a, in a minute. Just in general, uh, the customer allows us to remotely manage the vehicle charging. So we do not actually need a smart charging infrastructure. I will come to these the, the details in a second, but this program works uh, that we actually move the charging as an OEM. Uh, we just get a signal from the uh, utility and then uh, move the charging. So we moved it to a um, much more uh, palatable time for us. Uh, we moved it towards the more renewable uh, energy and we moved it towards the uh, less costly parts for the customer. And then uh, we've been looking at the uh, CO2 reduction potential and we have actually reduced the CO2 uh, reduction. Um, we have, sorry, we have increased the CO2 re reduction uh, to 32 percent uh, over that uh, that uh, that I just mentioned. So it's actually a much higher share of renewable energy in there. So um, the 32 percent is obviously uh, interesting for us as a uh, as an OEM because then we can obviously raise the claim that our electric vehicles are also um, CO2 emission free in the in the use phase, but they are also good for customers because we let them earn uh, first of all incentives for participating and they can profit off off peak uh, electricity prices. Uh, and obviously it does also have uh, an innovative aspect um, because not a lot of um, OEMs are offering these programs yet mostly as pilots, but we uh, already scaled it uh, up to a customer uh, project. But this is uh, a bit where the um, where the uh, trouble comes in. And I think this is something worth uh, discussing. So who is participating in these programs and what does that mean for the grid and what does that mean um, for scaling? Um, first of all, obviously we have us as an OEM. So we um, have uh, access to, uh, to EV owners, so we can market the program to them. And at the moment we do send charging control signals to the vehicle. So we do control uh, the charging signals and we only obviously allow the charging if the customer has opted into the program. Um, then we have uh, utilities. Uh, at the moment, it works uh, like this. The utility sends us the signal um, and they also incentivize the customer um, and uh, they basically dictate the schedule when um, the, when the uh, charging window basically is opened and then we move this charging window to a certain uh, point in time. Um, but we always have contracts with individual utilities. So we uh, only steer the charging according to the plan of an individual utility. So uh, if you're looking at it from the grid perspective, uh, having one utility and one OEM looking at uh, steered charging uh, does not optimize the grid. So you basically have a many-to-many -many problem. You have many utilities or TSOs or DSOs um, that want to control uh, or balance the grid. And you have many OEMs that can control their mostly their own vehicles. It depends a bit on the system, but most uh, OEMs nowadays have a connected vehicle fleet and um, could actually uh, interact uh, with the vehicle. But what you want is uh, 
from a grid perspective, you want a consolidated view. So you want to know when the grid needs uh, charging events, and then you want uh, these charging events distributed to where they are needed. And that might mean some customers uh, of one OEM need to stop charging now and other customers from maybe another OEM need to start charging now. And uh, that might mean if you look at it from the customer perspective, um, if I opt into a program from my OEM that I bought the vehicle from and I have a customer relationship with, I am incentivized to actually participate in the program. I get incentives. I can trust the OEM to only uh, move the charging window to where I um, where I want it. Um, but if um, I am working from a standardized program, I might um, have to yield control to somebody else. Um, so this is where the point from Christina comes in. If I'm looking at from the grid perspective, I need to go through uh, public charging uh, pillars. I need to have, an, have a third party controlling these charging events. Um, and then it gets much more difficult to incentivize uh, customers to actually participate in these events. And then the main incentive for the customer is actually if you move the uh, charging event to a, a tariff where the customer actually uh, saves money or you have to uh, pay them an, an additional incentive to actually uh, participate in the program. And I think these are a lot of the discussions that we actually do have at the moment uh, with DSOs, with TSOs. Uh, a lot of people want to go into this uh, charging business and uh, are talking about having uh, platforms where they uh, integrate the charging data uh, with each other. So I think this is going to be the next uh, big discussion that we're going to have even more if we're going to vehicle to grid, uh, where, as was mentioned, we also do have an issue, for example, with warranty. Um, and this uh, might, this is a main issue for us, because if we cede the control over the vehicle to somebody else, and they um, uh, conduct charging in a manner that damages the battery, uh, then we as a manufacturer might still be liable for the warranty. And so at the moment, we don't really allow third parties to control our vehicles. And that's in uh, not really in line with big uh, uh, vehicle to grid uh, charging programs. So I think these are some things that need to be solved either through um, public uh, intervention or through uh, private partnerships. Um, and uh, this is something that we've learned uh, doing here uh, in, in the US. And in the US, we've solved it by actually founding a platform with other uh, manufacturers. Uh, but if we're looking at, for example, uh, Europe or the, the rest of the, uh, sorry, it was in California. So the rest of the US is still um, uh, under discussion how we can do it. So the main issue for us as an OEM is uh, scaling. And I think it could be interesting to have a discussion on how you would think that this uh, development is going and um, how other players in this market can support it. So now I'm at the end of my presentation and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Monica. I know two main things that are uh, where we are in the frontier, uh, the platform on data sharing between the grid and the different OEMs, especially when it comes to control of the, uh, the smart vehicle fleet and smart public charging infrastructure. And also on the other side is on war warranties and the, um, especially when it relates to V2G. So you mentioned that there are some platforms being developed already in California not so much in the rest of the US or in Europe. Uh, would you be able to share more in terms of um, the, uh, the, the actors who started it in California and who might be able to initiate this, um, this platforms in different um, countries or in different states of the US? 
Yeah, I think we started it in California together with a couple of other OEMs and uh, uh, the utilities, but we found that it's rather difficult because we need to consolidate the data of various OEMs uh, with, uh, with each other. And also there's the question of who is actually giving the signals uh, that uh, are balancing the grid. So we as an OEM do not really have that responsibility. Um, in the in Europe, we've been talking, in Germany, we've been talking to uh, DSOs and TSOs because they do have um, an interest in balancing the grid. Um, and I think there are also some initiatives where they are forming such uh, platforms. And I think the question is more than um, there it is clear that a neutral party, so to speak, is steering the grid, but there is more the question of the relationship of the OEM and the customer, uh, who is controlling what, what influence do I as an OEM still have on the charging processes in terms of uh, the warranty or the customer satisfaction, uh, and what influence does the customer have on these uh, topics. Um, I think customers are very wary to cede uh, control over their vehicle. Um, for example, if uh, the charging window is moved to the next day and I suddenly have to leave the house because there's an emergency, I think these are topics that often come up when we talk to our customers. And I think this needs to be solved uh, to incentivize customers to actually participate in these programs. Um, thank you very much. Um, one final question before we go on to the next speaker. Um, it's a bit practical. So how is the user experience uh, and what are the possible constraints if a participant in your managed charging agrees to smart mm -hmm. charging? Yeah, um, they, they uh, first of all, they are invited. They agree to the uh, program. Then they download an app. And what happens is they get uh, suggested a... Um, if, if there's an event from the utility, uh, they send them a push notification and they say, for example, your charging window is moved from here to there. Do you agree? And they always are able to opt in or deny. So they, they have complete control over the charging process. We found that I think 90% of people uh, always agree to, the to moving the charging because it's mostly done uh, as I said, into windows where they do have an advantage, for example, for tariff, et cetera. Um, and they can also uh, state at the beginning if they'd rather want uh, their uh, um, the tariff to be optimized or the renewable energy share. So they also have a say uh, in that. Um, and um, then they get incentivized uh, by the um, utility in terms of participating in the program. And they also get uh, a reduced tariff from the utility and uh, they get a statement where they see uh, how much they actually saved in, um, in energy usage during, uh, during the month. Um, and if they participate in many um, events, we also do have an additional customer loyalty program from, from our side um, uh, where they can actually win uh, points. Uh, so a little bit of gamification is also involved. All right, thanks Monica. So I note that uh, they get benefits from the OEM and also from the, yes. uh, from the utility itself. So thank you very much uh, for sharing us uh, those insights. We now move on to the third part of our webinar where we look at the measures on the power system side. Christer Scotland is a senior engineer in the Norwegian Water Resources and Energy Directorate. He has focused on the technical aspects of the electricity grid in Norway in the past eight years. Norway is known for its high penetration of EV, so it would be interesting to know uh, and to hear from Kester about how they adapted to this. Uh, so without any further ado, um, Kester, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I suppose you can hear me now? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Um, well, yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm uh, currently working for the Norwegian Water Resources and Energy Directorate and um, tell you a little bit about uh, the EVs in Norway, how they have impacted the grid and how we 
kind of deal with it, so to say. Um, yeah, so the reason why I, from Norway, are talking here now is because we have, because 20% of the um, electric, now the cars in Norway are electric vehicles, uh, which is um, by far the um, largest share, uh, share in, in, uh, in the world. And uh, yeah, so the question is, how has this uh, um, impacted uh, the Norwegian grid? Uh, what are the consequences? Has it fallen apart? Has it started to burn? Has the grid uh, taken revenge of the cars or is it still standing strong? And the uh, short answer is that it's actually it's, uh, still standing strong. It's uh, the penetration uh, with all these electrical cars has uh, been uh, quite, not, no, not too many troubles uh, with that. Um, and one reason is maybe because we have a very high initial um, electricity use in Norway. Um, I, I think we have the highest share, uh, no, the highest uh, consumption of electricity per capita in the world. And I will show this uh, by, or I illustrated this by showing some graphs from uh, Germany. Uh, the blue one is the household consumption, like average household consumption in Germany. And the green one is um, accepted the uh, electrical vehicle charging and together uh, they form this red line. And this shows that uh, with electrical vehicle charging, then the consumption is um, maybe like doubled. Um, but in contrast, in Norway, we have this uh, high um initial uh, household consumption shown by the blue line so th this is kind of uh, uh, setting the dimensions for the electrical grid and if we add vehicle electric vehicle charging then the increase in absolute terms is the same as in germany but um yeah as you can see in relative terms it's it's not that high so um yeah, that's maybe one part of the reason why we have this high share, but it's uh, it's been quite okay actually. But we do have some like yeah, incentives, uh, for example, for um, shifting the electric vehicle uh, charging from this evening peak to nighttime. Not uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. But I'll try to explain. Okay. Yes, we can see your mouse pointer. You can see it. Okay. Then you can see that I'm pointing at where we want to uh, to shift the electric vehicle charging to during mostly during nighttime uh, because uh, the winter is uh, like the setting the dimension for uh, for the grid in Norway and um, we we don't have so much solar energy there. Uh, so I think uh, in, in other worlds, uh, other parts of the world, it's important to have the electric vehicle charging during the, the, the daytime or when it's blowing. But um, yeah, in Norway, we also have a lot of hydropower, uh, like 95% of our electrical production is from hydropower. So uh, yeah, it's quite flexible. So we have some uh, incentives to reduce the grid costs in, um, um, in Norway, uh, we are uh, currently working on a new capacity-based grid tariff. It's been an ongoing process since 2015, uh, still going, uh, going on. And we also have something called connection fee and um, a regulation called non-firm connection. So I'm going to explain this now. Um, yeah, this is just an example model for a new uh, grid tariff. Um, with, um, with a time of use uh, tariff and a capacity-based uh, tariff. Now it's kind of flat, like uh, around here. Um, but we, 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 uh, we want that green companies uh, should have some kinds of incentives for people to use their electricity um, in uh, non-peak hours, which is like during more during nighttime, and uh, in that uh, sense, it's it's mostly electric vehicle charging that that we think about, and um, yeah, 
because also in Norway, everyone has this um, electronic metering that's um, uh, showing the consumption for each hour. Uh, this may, may since uh, a couple of years ago, and this makes this uh, new tariffs possible. But uh, <clears throat> it's been a struggle to implement this. Uh, of course, uh, people see this as a way for the grid the companies to earn more money um, in hours where people need the electricity the most. So um, yeah, it, uh, it has been uh, the, the introduction of this uh, new grid tariffs has been postponed, postponed a couple of times. So um, maybe it will be introduced this summer. We'll see. Okay, and we also have something called connection fee, which means that uh, if you uh, have a new uh, customer, uh, for example, fast charging customer, um, charging station, then uh, this um, customer needs to pay for the grid to the um, point here. Um, but if there is capacity here, if there is available capacity, then then don't need to uh, pay this. Um, so um, yeah, it's, that is an incentive for uh, uh, having like new customers to uh, and, and localize them at kind of points in the in the grid where it's available capacity. So um, yeah, and this increases the use of whole, smart home charging. Because if, if people have to uh, increase their fuse, uh, then uh, they, they might have to pay, uh, pay to the grid companies. But uh, if they can like balance their load behind the fuse, then they don't have to pay this. We also have a uh, like new rule called a non-firm connection. Uh, this enables the grid companies to curtail consumption on terms that are agreed upon between the customer and the grid companies. And this makes it possible to connect customers faster and postpone or avoid grid investments. <clears throat> uh, this means that, uh, well, if you have uh, if you have a grid here and you have the new customer, a fast uh, charging station, for example, they um, they uh, connect themselves to the grid. Um, but if uh, if they, these people, for example, here, they need two megawatts. The fast charging needs two megawatts at maximum, but it's only one megawatt available. Um, so it's possible for, uh, for the fast charging station to not pay for upgrading the grid if the grid company can curtail the consumption uh, in hours where it's uh, the, um, the grid is like, the capacity is constrained and in Norway we have this uh, big fluctuation in uh, in use between summer and winter time so uh, and the capacity is usually set by like the n minus one capacity which means that uh, the green companies um, want a backup um, in case there's a failure so I mean um, this is the point where curtailment could occur um, but Usually it's not because uh, usually there's no uh, uh, errors or uh, failures in the grid, and uh, this rule also makes it possible to to um, use the available uh, capacity, which which is here, for example, and uh, also the available capacity as long as you don't have any failure. Okay, so uh, that's um, was. Uh, most of my presentation, although I just want to uh, mention this as well as Statnet that they, they are the TSO in Norway, and uh, they have been uh, they had this uh, test uh, program for uh, using electrical uh, charging of electrical wheels vehicles to stabilize the grid, and um, it's not um, vehicle to grid um, uh, here, but it's uh, it's just like to. To, to stop the charging and start the charging again uh, to, uh, to secure the frequency of the grid. So that was my presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Krister. So um, we have a few questions. Uh, I think one, um, one interesting is um, 
So as Christina mentioned earlier in her presentation, how fast charging will be uh, quite relevant, uh, especially uh, in terms of getting people into electric mobility and how that will be of particular need in um, or, or of particular concern for power systems. Uh, and then you showed earlier also this new plan about um, non-firm connection, uh, especially for fast charging. So my question is, um, how much fast charging stations are you beginning to see in Norway? Uh, are there a lot of them or not so much um, given the access to home charging? Uh, the exact numbers, I don't remember, but um, there are quite a lot of fast charging stations. Uh, it's I think it's <coughs> 100 cars for each fast charger. Mm. If I don't remember, uh, if I remember correctly, and um, yeah, it's so it's 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 a good amount, but of course, someone are uh, complaining that it's uh, it's not enough, and especially on the holidays when uh, everyone is driving to their cabin, for example, then the, it might be some queues on these uh, fast charging uh, stations, but um, yeah. 100 uh, charging fast charging points for, for no opposite 100 cars for each uh, fast charging point. I think think that's uh, what we're going to see in the future as well. All right, um, we have another question, um, uh, and I don't know um, if this was something elaborated in the um, connection proposal. So, um, would you be able to give an example of the savings that? Uh, uh, for a customer, so for example, a fast charging hub owner, uh, how much savings can they get by avoiding the connection fee through smart charging? Hmm. I um, well, no, I don't have the number in the head, but it's. I think it's. Uh, I think it's like it's it's efficient. It should be enough for people. Uh, just to because the, um, our data showed that the, the 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 car is plugged in anyway. I mean, it's it's plugged in all all uh, during uh, nighttime, for example, until the morning. So, <clears throat> um, if this is easy enough for people, I, I I think that most people will with with hold chargers will use the smart charging functionality, and it's. Um, yeah, I, I think it's also should be enough to save. So they will do this. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, thanks very much, Krister, for, for those insights. Um, we're moving now to our last speaker, uh, Shamasis Das. Shamasis is a senior practitioner with several years of experience in power systems and electric mobility, consulting for institutions such as the WRI and the World Bank. He led and co-authored publications on charging infrastructure implementation in India and vehicle grid integration in India, along with institutions such as Niti Aayog and Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy in India. He brings us uh, today a uh, unique insight of grid integration of electric vehicles in emerging economies. So without any further ado, the floor is yours, Shemesis. Thank you, Luis. And thank you, IEA, for giving me the opportunity to present in this important platform. Uh, so till now, uh, we have seen presentations uh, from uh, on, on learnings uh, from advanced markets. Just now, uh, Krista presented on how Norway approached electric vehicle grid integration. Uh, now, I'm going to actually uh, focus on the Asian emerging EV markets who might have you know, started their EV journey about three, four years back. If you see Norway's EV journey, I think from the policy point of view, they started about, or maybe more than a decade back actually. So uh, these Asian EV markets are, you can say at an early stage of their EV charging adoption curve. Uh, so let me uh, take you to the next slide. Yes. Um, so, in my presentation, I will uh, I'm considering two representative EV markets. One is India, where I'm coming from, and the other is Vietnam, an emerging EV market in Southeast Asia. 
Now, there is an interesting uh, similarity between these two EV markets, which is the dominance of light duty electric vehicles, uh, electric two and uh, electric three wheelers actually. So if, if you can see from the chart that uh, this, this vehicle segment dominates more than 90% of the EV share. Uh, and definitely electric buses are also uh, gradually getting deployed. So considering that the battery sizes of these electric vehicles are smaller than electric cars or electric buses, and these are primarily charged with low power EVACs or chargers, uh, it may, a question may arise that whether you know, charging of these vehicles pose any challenge to the distribution utility to the grid management. And uh, because there is a common myth that only high power chargers used for uh, four wheeler charging are responsible for any uh, you know, uh, grid interruption. So let me debunk this myth uh, by saying that uh, if you see the local context, uh, majority of the distribution utilities experience a uh, peak load during the evening time when uh, most of the you know, EVs are also expected to charge or at least you know, start charging. Um, and that may actually lead to accentuation of the uh, existing evening peak demand. And there could be also a scenario where even they can cause uh, nighttime secondary peaks. So this is actually at the service level of the distribution utility. More acute uh, you know, uh, disruption uh, is envisaged at the local level or at the distribution network level or at the feeder level. So why is it so? Uh, so the, I mean, if we consider just charging of one electric two wheeler or one electric three wheeler, definitely it doesn't pose any major risk because the power demand from, uh, from the use of single charger is not really that significant. But there is a high possibility of concentration of this charging at a particular locality, say at a residential locality, um, and uh, most of these EVs may start charging at around the same time during the night. Apart from that, uh, these chargings are going to use the existing electricity connections, uh, which are kind of mixed connections because these are like uh, either residential connections or in you know, a commercial connections. And uh, it may pose a challenge to the dis distribution utility to anticipate or to identify this new emerging load uh, and which is, which is actually necessary for them to plan uh, their you know, power procurement and also grid management. Moreover, all these points can actually lead to, uh, I mean, also point, indicate to another problem, which is whether the, you know, the distribution infrastructure across all the country uh, is at a condition which is desired. Because in many pockets, we see aging distribution network and the existing feeders may not have uh, the required uh, available holding capacity. So it, it shows that these countries need to take preemptive actions. Currently, the power demand from EV charging may not be prominent. And so the, uh, the repercussions, the consequences may not be really discernible, but it is important to anticipate the possible EV charging pattern and you know, uh, take uh, actions on priority. So how we can, or how the, the country, these countries can actually cope with this challenge. Uh, my previous speakers uh, already mentioned about ways to smoothen the, the, the grid, uh, vehicle grid integration. So there is an option for passive management, which entails, uh, you know, instruments uh, which influence uh, the charging behavior of EV users. Then there is unidirectional uh, active management, is essentially smart charging, uh, where you know, one can have direct control on the charging session. One can remotely initiate or end a charging event, or, and even can ramp up or ramp down the charging speed and so on and so forth. The other option is definitely bidirectional active management, which is also called the V2G, where electric vehicles can be applied as an energy storage, option and it can feed electricity back to the grid when necessary. So if we see these three options, uh, one can actually unlock 
these value streams actually. So fee shaving, arbitrage opportunities, frequency regulation services, and uh, you know it can also help to you know, increase the renewable energy offtake. And uh, one can see that you know some is possible through uh, both passive uh, measures and V2G, along with smart charging. Some is possible uh, primarily based on V2G. Uh, so these are the different charging levels of PGI. And uh, one can see that as you know, the, the different levels are actually, so these are can be considered as different maturity levels. So starting with time of use pricing, which is the passive uh, management, to V2G, one can actually realize more value in the grid flexibility services. Uh, however, it is easier said than done because there are actually complexities in implementation and also there are economic challenges. So anyway, so there are three primary use cases as we see here. One is the, the passive measures. Uh, the second is the aggregated smart charging with in unison with passive measures. And the last is the large scale V2G. Now, before policymakers, distribution utilities and regulators, take actions, uh, take reforms, actually, uh, they have to also, they should take into uh, account the techno-economic uh, advantages and challenges. So uh, definitely, I mean, there is no denying the fact that unmanaged charging it is inexpensive. Uh, it can be done in the BAU kind of situation. Uh, it is definitely not viable. It's not a viable option for the future. To future proof, electric mobility it is important to uh, migrate away from unmanaged or dumb charging towards you know different uh, you know more sophisticated ways of ev charging now, the, so in the extreme axis uh, in the other point of the axis is the v2g uh, which enables you know greater range and value of grid flexibility services but as we understand that it also involves uh, you know more technological advancement requirements at different levels, I mean, across all the uh, components of EV charging, right from the, the electric vehicle battery to the vehicle to the, and to the charger. So all these actually upgradations also entail a higher cost to implement. Uh, and this should be taken into account while you know, the, the, the Asian emerging countries uh, start planning their implementation. The other option is, as I mentioned, are the passive measures. Uh, so the classic examples are the TOD tariffs. TOD tariffs, uh, I mean, uh, the tariffs which uh, which have uh, uh, which are more static, which uh, have you know which offer rebates during the off peak hours, and there is surcharge on the energy charges during the peak hours actually to to kind of induce uh, the the EV users to shift their charging events during the off-peak hours. So these are easy to administer. Uh, it's less complicated for the EV users to participate, uh, but it definitely it offer limited grid benefits. And so it can be considered as definitely a near-term solution. And um, the other option is smart charging with passive measures. It seems to be an attractive proposition. Uh, and as we can see that, you know, uh, these different options uh, stand at different uh, buckets. Of, of the techno-economic evaluation. So before uh, the policymakers decide on their actions, it is important also for them to consider the local context. What are the uh, existing laws and regulations? What is the uh, mobility pattern, the charging pattern, and which may also you know, vary from province to province. So before uh, these countries, uh, plan a roadmap for implementation, it is important to take stock of the current situation. Now, if we consider these two countries, India and Vietnam, uh, against the key requirements to plan all these interventions, uh, we see that in some cases, there are existing provisions and, and, there are, uh, and on the other hand, there are actually um, regulatory and technological gaps. So let's start with passive measures. So TOD and TOU tariffs, TOU tariffs are more real-time tariffs, more dynamic tariffs. Uh, if we uh, consider Indian market, uh, we see that in some states, there are actually TOD tariffs. So TOD tariff uh, has precedence in India. Uh, it's applicable to certain consumer categories, um, uh, including EV charging uh, by default in, in some states. And also some states have introduced 
specific TOD tariff regime for EV charging. It is important to mention here that in India, uh, tariff framing is a state subject. That means the regulator at the province, in the province, uh, they actually decide on the tariff uh, framework. So it's not actually like a homogeneous uh, regulatory framework across the country. So it varies from state to state. Uh, across all the states, we see that currently there is no dynamic POU tariffs actually. So it is it is yet to see its first you know uh, first implementation even at a pilot scale. On the other hand, Vietnam uh, as uh, I mean similar to Indian market, there are specific consumer categories, but there is yet to see uh, dynamic POU tariffs. The other important regulatory tool uh, is the demand charge because demand charge actually helps to cap on the, the, the power demand actually. So currently uh, demand charges are applicable in, in many states, uh, but uh, in, in the recent guideline from Ministry of Power, uh, there is a kind of a recommendation that demand charge can be waived to make EV charging more cost effective to reduce you know, the, the burden of the charge phone operators to provide charging service. Uh, but till now, uh, there are demand charges in, in many states. In Vietnam, uh, as I see that there is no currently demand charge for any consumer category. The other important intervention is whether EV charging uh, has a dedicated meter related scanner because it, it, it gives visibility to the distribution utilities to you know, kind of identify the emerging load and plan accordingly. Although there is no blanket requirement across India, but uh, in many states, uh, there are uh, requirements to have dedicated metered connections to avail EV special tariffs. So in states where there are separate EV tariffs, preferential tariffs for EV charging, there's a need to have an exclusive EV connections. Otherwise there's no blanket requirement. In Vietnam, uh, currently, there are very few public charging stations installed and there is no such regulatory requirement till now. Now coming to aggregated smart charging. So the prerequisite to carry out the smart charging measures uh, is uh, deployment of the programmable charges. Now we have to be mindful that programmable charges uh, can be as basic as you know, just having a functionality, functionality to synchronize with the POD tariffs uh, and it can be as advanced as uh, enabling uh, control on the EV charging rate. Uh, I mean, it, it can even enable modulate the EV charging speed actually. So you can ramp up or ramp down. It can even allow uh, the charging stations to respond to uh, different tariff instruments and so on and so forth. Uh, in India, uh, there are actually programmable charges deployed, but in, in many cases, the smart control features are disabled because there is lack of use case. Um, and these are mostly used for electric four wheeler charging. In Vietnam, as I mentioned, since there are very few public charging stations, there is no reported adoption of programmable charges. The other important aspect to implement uh, smart charging is uh, the communication architecture. So communication architecture is going to play uh, a pivotal role uh, to carry out large scale smart charging. And uh, the, the, the requirement is to embrace a uniform communication protocol at different levels to allow large scale interactions. So the interactions may happen between uh, the EVAC and the charger and the charging management system or CMS between even between two charging networks and between the, you know, the charge point operator or the EV user uh, with the distribution utility. It is important that um, the market players adopt uh, open source protocols for communication. Uh, in India, it is, uh, th there is no such mandate uh, to adopt a, a particular communication protocol, but it is expected that uh, OCPP uh, would be adopted for the EVSC CMS interaction, OCPI uh, will be adopted to allow e-roaming and open ADR for the communication uh, between the distribution utility and the other market players to carry out demand response. In Vietnam, uh, currently there is no such consideration. And next, the large scale V2G implementation, which is kind of the ultimate uh, goal or ultimate level to achieve. Uh, I find that the, the, exist, the existence of ancillary service market is going to play an important role because it can help unlock the system wide benefits of V2G 
because unless there are actually uh, uh, benefits to the EV users and the charge point operators to partic from participating in different power markets, uh, um, I think there will be less driver for the market players to adopt the V2G. And so to provide these incentives, uh, they, they should have access to different power markets. In India, currently, uh, ancillary service market at a, busy, at a very nascent stage, as you can see that the first regulation has been notified just uh, in the beginning of this year. Also, uh, the existing regulations, uh, including the ancillary service market regulation, doesn't really recognize uh, the need for resource aggregation. This is going to be important for electric vehicles because ultimately these are all distributed uh, or dispersed resources, and only one electric vehicle won't be provide won't be able to provide the grid benefits. The they have to be aggregated actually uh, at, at to, to a certain scale, and so the regulations need to recognize uh, the need for resource aggregation and the role of aggregators. But currently, it is not there. And in Vietnam also, it, it doesn't exist. What about the, the EVSs and the EVs? Because we understand to carry out VTG, we require special equipped electric vehicle supply equipment and EVs. Currently uh, in India, there's no such deployment uh, because as you can see uh, in one of the presentations, uh, we saw that most of the deployments or uh, most of the pilot projects happened in Europe and North America and a bit in Asia Pacific. In rest of Asia, there is no such V2G implementation in now or you know, availability of V2G uh, technology and Vietnam is no exception. The important step for these countries uh, to initiate uh, action towards V2G is carrying out pilot projects to do some demonstration. Uh, there are a few reported initiatives taken by technical institutions here in India, uh, but the results or the outcomes or the learnings from these uh, pilot projects are not really available in the public domain. So it is important that they uh, disseminate their understanding actually. Um, um, and in Vietnam also, uh, I haven't seen any reported case of a pilot project. So these are the three uh, important interventions which I find uh, would be important for this, uh, for this EV markets to carry out effective EV grid integration. One is the implementation of or adoption of TOD or TOU tariff regime along with demand charges. For aggregate smart charging, it's important to adopt a uniform communication protocol at different levels. And to carry out V2G, it's important to have the, you know, different types of power markets, including ancillary service market. So to chart a roadmap for, this, uh, for these countries, uh, what kind of principles one can adopt? So these are like a uh, few uh, major suggestions, actually, a uh, few guiding principles they can refer to. Definitely at the top is uh, to make sure implementation happens in a cost-effective way, because we understand that uh, you know, increasing the capex may not really encourage, say, charge point operators to, to you know, go for vehicle grid integration, because already we find that EV charging service is not really a profitable venture uh, because of lack of charging demand. So increasing the capex uh, really doesn't make sense. But the other thing is uh, the framework should be simple uh, so that EV users, charge point operators, or you know other stakeholders can easily participate. A uh, complicated regime will not really serve the purpose. Uh, the third principle, uh, which is uh, I find important, is uh, to consider the existing laws and regulations, see which provisions can be leveraged to carry out vehicle grid integration, uh, and then you know, identify uh, you know, possible scope for reforms. So alignment with existing laws and regulations would be important. And definitely it's no brainer that the need of the hour is to defer the need for expensive grid upgrades. All these interventions are actually uh, considered with the sole objective to avoid the immediate need for any uh, grid upgradation. Um, now, so this is uh, an indicative pathway for EV grid integration for the emerging EV markets. And these are some of the cases, actually, some of the basic, uh, um, you know, uh, or you can say the rationale considered to identify this pathway. So, uh, one can consider the level of maturity of the existing market, both the immobility and the power market. What is the status of VGA International? Because learnings from advanced markets would be important. 
And then what are the unique uh, local challenges? Actually, that would be also important to consider. Uh, now, in the inception phase, so in, in the roadmap, uh, uh, it is suggested to take a phased approach for implementation, starting with passive management. So initially, policymakers and regulators can prioritize passive management. So starting with the TOD tariffs for EV charging, uh, regulators need to actually notify the interconnectivity regulations, also stipulate the standards for program charges, because these are actually the fundamental requirements to carry out vehicle, vehicle grid integration, as well as, you know, uh, to kind of uh, direct uh, or, you know, issue directive on data sharing and monitoring, because this would be important for the discussion utilities to understand the charging pattern and what it's its impact on their load. And definitely there should be a guideline for the private and public EV charging. So these are actually the incremental regulations required. So what about the incremental technology requirements to carry out uh, passive measures? Uh, one is, you know, simple programmable chargers, which are in inexpensive. They can be adopted initially for private charging. They need not to be uh, very fancy. Uh, and for electric four wheelers, more three and more four charging should be kind of mandated and a smart meter should be deployed at the facility level. To go to the next rung of the ladder, uh, which is the aggregated smart charging, uh, I think demand charges would be important. Here, uh, I have suggested a nuanced approach instead of, uh, you know, in, 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 instead of introducing fixed demand charges, the demand charge can be made, uh, you know, kind of dynamic based on the actual load because this will incentivize the charge phone operators to reduce their load to save uh, energy cost, as well as it will not really burden them on, uh, you know, on excessive demand charges. The other uh, instrument would be the real-time time of use tariffs, right? And then, as I mentioned, that OCPP, OCPI, OPDR, these are going to be important, and the distribution of the DOMS system, which is distribution energy management resource system. And uh, definitely aggregation of resource and access to multiple markets, which I have already highlighted, this would be important as well. Now, only if these regulations will not suffice, the technology has to be in line with the regulations. So that means the, the charge point operator should be mandated to adopt uh, charges which are compliant with the latest version of OCPP. Uh, and, uh, you know, the EV should have some advanced telematic systems. So, to go, to go to the ultimate level of uh, VGI, if I say, uh, access to all power markets is important to unlock the different benefits, grid level benefits, and uh, some of the regulations which are currently in vogue uh, to support prosumers, they can be actually leveraged like net or gross meeting regulations. And already uh, the other speakers have highlighted the issue of vehicle warranty. Uh, so should be a regulation whether I mean, how to deal with the vehicle warranty in case of V2G. And definitely you now you need to uh, deploy widespread V2G enabled charging system. So these are some of the solutions uh, to do that. And, uh, and also this need to bring EV models which have this functionality. Uh, in case of EV charging market, there is another advantage, which is, you know, uh, since Electric two wheelers and electric three wheelers, they dominate the charging, the, the, the dominate the EV market. Uh, these chargers can be actually, the chargers to cater to their charging demand can be deployed in a distributed manner in, instead of just concentrating these charging points at one locality, because this will help limit the local power demand, because the main issue is actually the impact at the local level or at the feeder level. And we and most of these cities or urban agglomerations, they have the ubiquitous low voltage lines which can be actually leveraged to cater to these uh, charging points. Sorry, also, um, yes, um, Can I request you to uh, wrap up this part now as we are- Yes, just time. 10 seconds uh, actually, yeah. just yeah, 10 sure. seconds, yeah. Uh, and also uh, one might have seen that uh, battery swapping is gaining popularity in these markets. This is also an advantage to their end because here the, the batteries can be charged outside the EVs in a controlled manner and this will not have any negative implication on the on the power system. So, so these are the other viable options for the Asian countries. For more details, I would actually urge the, the participants to check this two reports, the like integration report, which I published in year 2020. And last year, 
um, uh, this handbook was released by Ministry of Power and uh, the Department of Science and Technology where uh, I have been speaking uh, to people. So, and, and for more details, please reach out to me. These are my opinions. Thank you, thank you. And uh, apology for taking that's all right. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, actually uh, answered some of the questions along your speech, especially regarding the absence of some pilot uh, phases of electric uh, electric smart charging in other countries in Southeast Asia, but some um, initiated in India. One follow up question for you is that do you have any specific recommendations on how to phase in smart charging for electric two and three wheelers as opposed to four wheelers? How to phase in? the smart charging of right. two and three wheelers as opposed to four wheelers. Right. So uh, one suggestion uh, which I've been even included in the handbook is uh, adopt uh, cost-effective uh, programmable charges, which can be synchronized with the time of day tariffs uh, that did not to be uh, very sophisticated, that did not to have all the control and monitoring capabilities. Uh, where, you know, so these charges can be actually employed in private EV charging as well as in workplace charging. So this is, uh, uh, I think, the key suggestion uh, to, you know, kind of incorporate some of the smart charging elements in electric two-wheeler and electric three-wheeler charging. And for electric four-wheeler charging, as I mentioned, that uh, mode three and mode four would be required. And they have already the intrinsic uh, uh, control capabilities. Does does it address your question, uh, Luis? Yeah, so it's, it was a question from the audience, but I think uh, uh, we'll have um, we'll be able to share more from the from the publication that you mentioned. Uh, of course, we'll share the link there as well. So at this point, we'll have we'll be able to address more of the questions uh, in our panel discussion. However, before we go there, we would like to have a short break just so everyone would be able to um, have a quick one. So um, let, we will do a three minute break uh, and then come back. Sorry, let's do four minute break and come back at uh, 4.30 um, and uh, where we would start directly uh, the panel discussion with our speakers. So four minute break, thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome back everyone to our panel discussion. Yeah, all right. Um, thank you very much for your presentations, um, Christina, Monica, Christopher, and Shamasis. Um, we welcome everyone to our panel discussion. Again, we encourage you to uh, continue asking your questions. Really interesting. Our panel discussion today would uh, focus on answering uh, the main question on what are the aspects of the electric mobility ecosystem that we need to be aware of so that we can ensure a successful grid integration in different contexts, especially when we change context from an advanced economy to a low and middle income economy. There are also different contexts, of course, such as if it's an island grid, if there's a high variable renewable energy share, um, if it has specific decarbonization goals. Um, but 
the idea is to be able to flesh out uh, the different aspects that we need to um, be aware of. And uh, with this question, I would like to start with Christina. What do you think um, are the main things that we need to be aware of in this ecosystem? Yeah, I think that you have already mentioned. So first, uh, I would say main thing is to understand this scenario where we are uh, willing to analyze uh, the vehicle grid integration. So which is the status of our energy grids for sure, or energy mixed, and also the regulation that is on place. So I would say that these are the three main aspects that we should take into account. Later on, on uh, my, my colleagues in their presentations, they have uh, already also touched this point, is to analyze the behaviors of the uh, drivers in this, uh, in this scenario. So at the end, obviously, I, I always said that um, electrifying mobility is not changing uh, an IC a car from an electric car. This is not the idea. This is not the objective. But uh, you have to analyze how the users behave. And at least you need to cover or to, to understand that this, how this should be covered by the electrification of the mobility. We have been uh, discussing two wheels, three wheels. So there are many different uh, mobility schemas and uh, we should analyze it before um, let's say implementing the policies. So those two main uh, things I would I would say. So energy system, how the grid is, how the energy mix is, how is the regulation that is on place, so that we can identify what we have to change, and on the other side, users. So how do people behave? Which is the infrastructure we have, and what is the really electrification that can happen on the next, let's say five to 10 years uh, in this in this framework. Yeah, thank you very much. I know that there's a specific um, factor on um, the users and the electric mobility behavior. So I would like to ask uh, Monica, in term, um, given that you're able to have a close contact with the consumers, what can you say about uh, um, the electric mobility uh, charging behavior are there any changes even before the managed charging program? Yes, I think it's a, uh, obviously if you think about the um, combustion engine, uh, you have this uh, picture in mind of uh, if the uh, gas tank is empty, I go to the gas station and I fuel up. And so you transfer this to the EV and you say, okay, if the battery is empty, I will go to a station and I'll uh, get uh, energy there um, and then you get discouraged because it uh, takes a comparatively long time. Um, so I think what needs to happen instead is to looking at the behavior of the uh, of the uh, consumer, where are they driving and where are they parking their cars for a long time? Because these are opportunities for charging and these are also opportunities for the vehicle to grid topics and so forth that we've uh, mentioned. Because obviously if you want to connect, uh, if you want to use these uh, models, the car has to be connected to the grid. Um, I can give you an example. We looked at uh, data from our own workplace. And what happens is in the morning, people get to work, they plug in their car, um, and then they leave and they go uh, to work. And the car sits there for the whole day. Um, and it's fully charged by, let's say, um, 11 or so. Um, and but the people leave at six, so you have a whole time frame in which you can uh, use this vehicle, use the storage in the vehicle for vehicle to grid. But obviously, you need to tell the customer because if they expect to be leaving by eleven, they need to the car to be uh, fully charged. Uh, but what I'm saying is there are a lot of incidents uh, that that are pre predestined for uh, charging and for the use of these business models we just need to identify them and we need to basically train the consumer to think in a different manner so they don't they are not afraid that they will be left without energy but they can see um, 
that these uh, models can happen and not inconvenience the consumer in any way. I think this is very important for the success of these models. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think um, there's also um, a big discussion in terms of how um, this particular behavior will be adopted. And while we have a lot of early adopters now, um, it could very much change between um, the early adoption to mass market um, adoption. So I would like to ask in this, um, from this line of thinking, given that behavior, uh, local behavior um, is important for successful grid integration. Um, Krista, have you seen any changes between, uh, in terms of charging behavior between when it was still, um, you know, early small percentage EV penetration now that it's a high um, penetration of EV in Norway? Um, actually not, or not, but uh, it's not that I have fully uh, the complete overview of how people charge, but uh, uh, I mean, still after, because a couple of years ago, we, we, we had this new um, power pricing uh, system, uh, which uh, which means that people pay the, the price by the hour and not like the average price during the whole day <clears throat> because of this uh, automatic metering system. But still, uh, people are uh, charging like uh, quite a lot during the evening peak. So uh, I can um, I can uh, copy a uh, link uh, showing the charging pattern uh, in Norway in the in the chat, so you, you can see. But um, yeah, so far people are still not like um, adjusting the charging patterns. But yeah, so far in Norway that has been handled well, like by the excess capacity in the grid. All right. Um, thanks. You. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Krister. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the, the views of Ashamasi. So uh, in many ways, the diffusion of electric mobility is different uh, in emerging economies. As you mentioned, the big ones are two and three wheelers and electric buses. So why do you think so? Um, why do you think this is the case? Um, and what do you think is um, um, what would it mean in terms of grid, grid integration? Um, so if, if, if we see the, the adoption of the past five, six years, uh, uh, we can see that 98% of the EV sales happen in the electric two and electric three segments. And also uh, the governments uh, in most of these countries, uh, they have emphasized on rolling out electric buses for public transport, because that is also an area uh, where, you know, uh, GHG emissions can be mitigated. So this is, I mean, this is the paradigm or this is the trajectory which these EV markets are taking currently. And uh, we anticipate that this trend will continue um, at least uh, till the near future, till 2030. Uh, definitely um, with, you know, increase in, um, you know, the per capita income and with increase in uh, more electric four-wheeler models available in the market. Because if you see these markets, there are very few electric four-wheeler models available actually to, to purchase. So uh, as OEMs also see that, okay, there is a market uh, which can be tapped. I think uh, if electric four-wheeler adoption will also increase. Now, irrespective of whether it is only the electric LDVs which uh, you know, gain uh, the traction or the, or the bus segment or the electric four-wheeler segment, there are actually specific reasons why uh, you know, they are charging Will have will have potentially impact on the power system, which I, I think I, I highlighted in my presentation that uh, you know concentration of low power charges in a specific locality uh, can actually cause overloading at the feeder level, in spite of you know not using high power charges. In case of electric buses, um, we see that you know the charges are rated at 240 kilowatt, uh, and that may also increase to you know increase the charging rate, and it, it shows that uh, at a particular bus depot, the power de demand will be quite significant. 
and it would require you know high tension cables, which anyway currently it, they, they require. Uh, but you know uh, it, they may require actually exclusive feeders to to cater to the charging demand. Uh, existing feeders may not be sufficient to meet the load. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, I hope this ant answers your uh, your question. Yeah. Um... Thanks a lot. Uh, there's this, um, uh, you mentioned this idea of, you know, being able to exclusively um, provide them feeders. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's a unique context of, um, you know, there's a global goal to achieve electricity access before 2030. Um, do you think in um, emerging economies, is electric mobility competing with other goals such as rural electrification, or is it an opportunity to accelerate it? Of course, uh, we'd like to welcome um, the answer, um, the thoughts of um, Christina, Monica, and Christo as well. Uh, of course, in um, in Norway, there's also a, a huge amount of um, rural areas as well. So, but Chamasis, uh, what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, let me clarify that exclusive feeders would be required uh, for you know for catering the charging demand of electric buses because if you see the battery sizes of these buses and the charges which are utilized for charging these buses, uh, that actually kind of lead to high power demand um, at, at a particular locality. So definitely separate the feeders would be required. But for other charging use cases, uh, I don't think there would be need for dedicated feeders. Uh, what I would like to highlight is these charges should be connected to dedicated EV metered connections. That means existing connections, be it at home or be it at a workplace or any other you know, facility should not be ideally used for EV charging because then it becomes difficult for the distribution utility to really read the, the demand which is emerging from, from, from these uh, you know, centers. Uh, and also it, it helps the regulators to introduce EV specific tools or EV specific regulations or you know, tariff instruments uh, which only EV charging uh, use cases can benefit from. Otherwise, you know, this uh, can be also exploited by other types of consumer categories because currently to promote EV adoption, tariffs are actually kept at a lower end. I mean, these are like preferential EV tariffs. So having separate metered connections, I think would be more important. Um, Christina, uh... I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that or? Well, I think that um, he has uh, explained it from the first hand, which is always important. Um, I think that he has pointed some important things. And, and, and at the end, what we have to, to understand is that there are some places, some, some countries where we are really facing the, uh, let's say, um, charging infrastructure deployment. And uh, then we should deploy it uh, in the way that it will help us, not, uh, as you said, not compete with. So that, that would be my, my message. So when planning, when thinking how to uh, fund, how to um, typically uh, help the uh, local administration or the companies, to deploy this infrastructure, thinking always on having the electrification of the mobility as a enabler, for instance, for more uh, renewable energy penetration or uh, for other uh, mechanisms that, that we may foresee and never uh, go on a competition, as you said, with, for instance, funds for uh, installing uh, local PV or any other, um, any other uh, energy transition uh, let's say, well, not activity is not the word, but, but investment. Okay, so that's, that was what I would, um, yeah, understand. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I would like now to um, look at the, so um, the aspect of being able to integrate renewables. And so you mentioned uh, other goals such as solar PV and in, uh, and in all presentations, we saw the potential to um, be able to support renewables integration by shifting load. So not only are we able to um, manage the charging impact, we are actually able to leverage it as a, as a grid resource. Um, 
what are the ways uh, in terms of um, being able to find business models or um, being able to have platforms um, that would allow us to leverage the VRE. So we, we already have some, um, we already saw some of the overview from the presentations, but um, I would like to um, explore on this further in terms of um, how can they actually develop. So for example, um, one might say um, grouping or aggregating um, electric uh, electric vehicle through buildings. So maybe a workplace is the one uh, that would enter into corporate power purchase agreement, and then the load that they offer is electric vehicles. Um, would you be able to give us some more details on this kinds of uh, what do you think are the kinds of business models, kinds of uh, transactions that would actually occur to allow us to do this? Um, I don't know who would like to answer the question first. Um, you want, okay. I, can, I can continue and then anyone uh, can continue me. Yeah, in fact, there are many interesting um, ongoing ideas on that. So our energy service companies, for instance, offering combining uh, investment, uh, taking into account, obviously, for instance, uh, a photovoltaic model on a building together with uh, an uh, installation of different uh, typically different kind of electric vehicle chargers so that you can uh, optimize the behavior of the of the building together with offering new services either on uh, and on offices but also you can think on commercial buildings hospitals airport i mean there are many many uh, use cases being being analyzed around the world and, uh, and it's an opportunity. And I think this is a, 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 a thing that we have learned and that is important that is, is uh, well understand that um, the electric vehicle can really increase the local, uh, local renewable generation on, uh, on site. So the, the consumption of this generation, of this local generation. And this is a, an important fact because also we will avoid the discussion that it was also on the questions regarding the energy mix, the global energy mix. So we are doubling the benefit because we will charge our vehicle from a renewable source. And also we will increase for sure the renewable penetration on, on let's say on the local, uh, the local level. And uh, obviously we cannot forget uh, renewables on the system and so on, but focusing on, on solutions on the field, that combination is really powerful. Yeah, and uh, if I may add uh, to that, I think this goes from the individual customer when they have a house and they have a PV uh, and they, have, they are looking for storage, they can use their vehicle instead um, up to the uh, local level uh, when, uh, like, for example, uh, Shamasis was talking about the uh, buses needing uh, a quick burst of energy uh, and either you have a storage facility that you build or you use existing batteries like for example vehicles for that um, and uh, obviously the total grid if you wanted to um, uh, to store the uh, the energy uh, in separate storage facilities those would be huge batteries needed and uh, why don't we use the batteries that are already produced we want to um, reduce the usage of materials and uh, why not uh, why not use them um, we all know that uh, vehicles are not used for the main part of the day um, and i think the main part as i've said before is to uh, coordinate the availability of storage uh, with the demand um, i can i can just add here if you allow um, as uh, you know my colleagues uh, alluded to that there are two options to integrate renewable energy with EV charging. One is you increase the uh, you know, renewable energy offtake from the system, from the grid. So that can be done by designing POD tariff regime in line with the availability of renewable energy in, in, the, in the power system. Uh, I think in one of the presentations, we saw a dark curve. So considering the dark curve, you can actually design the POD tariff to incentivize EV users to charge when renewable energy is shared in the grid is on the higher side. Now, if we see, uh, uh, if we consider the, the on-site generation, uh, there are challenges uh, because 
you know the the generation capacity may not be sufficient to to fully cater to the charging demand that is one second is when uh, you are able to you know generate renewable energy basically during the day times through solar pv charging may not happen during that time uh, because we anticipate that majority of charging may happen during the evening or during the night time right so th that energy uh, may remain unutilized definitely energy storage can be added battery energy storage but that will ultimately translate to higher capital investment and which may not be really attractive for a charging service provider at the current context so regulations like say net metering or gross metering net uh, net, net billing there are different provisions regular provisions that can be utilized to utilize actually the 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 grid as the energy storage so you export the surplus renewable energy generated to the grid and you draw back that electricity during the night time when there is more demand actually so regulations i think would be would play a critical role to realize effective renewable energy ev integration yeah, um, thanks for that, uh, Monica and Chamesis um, and Christina. And I would like to jump off on that, actually, um, given that we've established that there are so many ways that we're in, we could actually increase the adoption of variable renewable energy. I would like to ask uh, Christer, um, in Norway, there's a lot of hydro, um, but then there's also wind potential. Are there plans to increase uh, wind uptake? Um, in many ways, uh, have different patterns have daily uh, different daily patterns compared to solar PV. Um, are there any ways of leveraging the already existing and available EV um, uh, load for that? <clears throat> no, there's no plans to like uh, increase the uptake of wind actually because it's so well. It, it's 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 not any problem. Uh, uh, we, in the in the next uh, ten years, I don't think we will have any more wind. Uh, the you know, power in Norway, it's uh, there has been built some wind power uh, last uh, lately, but uh, the um, resistance to this is quite big in Norway now. But uh, so because we have like ninety five percent of the electrical uh, production is from from hydropower and at least half of this is like well regulated uh, um, hydropower which can regulate uh, quite much so yeah it's been most most focused on uh, the fast frequency reserves like using electric vehicles for fast uh, frequency reserves uh, which i uh, mentioned um, at the last of my presentation so uh, because that's even faster than the hydropower is able to uh, to adjust as well. So, yeah, and so it's uh, this and and to, to reduce like the stress on the grid. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so I think uh, so. We're almost uh, uh, we're running out of time, but um, there are some important questions here that we would like to, um, you know, given all of these plans of how uh, V two G V one G could help. Uh, a big concern seems to be on the battery, and I think Monica would be able to answer this. Um, what are the you know effects on the different either just V1G, uh, mm -hmm. just providing this kinds of uh, um, load shifting, uh, but then also on V2G, what are the things that you found so far as yeah. the OEM? Yeah, we found that um, it depends on the actual um, uh, the actual program used to uh, to charge the vehicle. Um, if you just uh, shift the uh, charging uh, behavior and uh, don't do anything else to the vehicle, uh, the battery is totally fine. Uh, even if you charge and decharge it a couple of times, it uh, doesn't really uh, do anything uh, to the uh, to the battery. Where uh, problems come in if there's quick uh, um, uh, charging events in uh, in succession, and I think the uh, main issue with um, the warranty topic is that uh, we 
it, it, it is hard for us at a, as an OEM to be liable for something that uh, somebody else steers. So as long as we can steer the charging events, we can assess the danger, and uh, so to speak, to the battery, and we can mitigate it. Uh, but if we see the controls to a third party or third party platform, um, we cannot control the, um, the actual charging events. Um, however, if they are not misused, uh, there should not be a huge impact on the battery from what we've seen. All right. Um, next one, I guess. So, yeah. Yes, uh, we have, uh, yeah. well, I, I would recommend for those interested to uh, see there are several works done by uh, PTU in Denmark, Vetecom in France, and also the Canadian uh, Institute for Energy Research on this regard. And they have seen uh, specifically in B2G that we have the conclusions one year and a half ago. And um, they have seen, as Monica said, depending on the, on the user pattern, it could be even beneficial because there is the calendar effect on the battery and uh, it could be even beneficial for your battery to, to do this kind of activity. And also I would like to mention that many manufacturers nowadays already on the cars that have been uh, done or uh, manufacturers in the last two years already include uh, B2G activity on the warranties on the battery. So that, that was an interesting change that happened a couple of years ago. And, um, and that I, I think that it's important to, to mention that uh, nobody has covered these activities so that uh, your warranty is not, is not uh, let's say, affected by this activity. Thank you very much, Christina. I'll certainly take a look at that. That was uh, an interesting uh, finding. Um, we're uh, wrapping up now, but I would like to ask in 30 seconds each, uh, what is your final message uh, to everyone in terms of what is the most important thing that they should um, take a look at in integrating um, electric vehicles into the grid? So starting with you, Christina. Well, uh, I would say two in 30 seconds. First, uh, learn from those that have been uh, some years dealing with it because uh, I always recommend it even in Spain, <laughs> uh, don't start from scratch. So there's many findings findings on, on, on the table. So learn from them and start from there, from their mistakes and their lesson learns. And, uh, and the other one is do not forget the users. So do not focus only on energy system, on policies or regulation. We need the, the users in the center uh, in order to make all this uh, happen. Thank you very much, Monica. Yes, I would also uh, like to start with the, with the user and the consumer. I think they are crucial for uh, the success of these uh, business models. So I would say that um, uh, they need to be understood, their patterns need to be understood, and also uh, their fears and uh, concerns need to be taken uh, seriously by anybody operating uh, such a platform. Um, and uh, by default, I think um, we as OEMs are very willing to work with uh, platforms and uh, work as an uh, intermediate between platforms and users. Um, and a lot of OEMs are going in this direction. And I think the way forward is to uh, actually uh, link uh, OEMs, utilities, um, and uh, DSOs, TSOs. Uh, through through a platform and therefore uh, some regulation is needed in my opinion. Thank you very much, Monica. Christer? Well, as a representative for, uh, for a regulator, I guess I need to say that you need uh, a good uh, regulation in uh, <coughs> as a basis for uh, developing this, yeah. Thank you very much, Christer. Um, 30 seconds, last message, Shamasis. Uh, so I, I will again emphasize the four guiding principles which I highlighted in my presentation while charting the roadmap for VGI implementation. So one is definitely the, the priority should be to defer any need for grid upgradation uh, instead of you know, front loading the investment, it's better to defer it. Second is the implementation has to be cost effective. Um, third is uh, the mechanism should be easy to administer and uh, you know, simple for the stakeholders to participate. And uh, fourth is uh, anything left, uh, uh, yeah. uh, utilize the existing provisions 
uh, in the laws and the regulations and then identify the need for reforms. Thank you very much. Um, and that wraps up. I'd like to thank all of the speakers uh, for joining us today and sharing uh, their insights, their expertise. Uh, I now hand back the floor to Fer for his closing remarks. Thank you very much, Luis. And just three quick things. I know we are uh, two minutes past um, the end time. Uh, first of all, again, yes, uh, as you, Luis, thank the speakers for your very comprehensive uh, presentations uh, and also responding very well to the questions and keeping within the 30 second of the last uh, key recommendations to uh, us. The second thing is to just to say that this is not just a one off standalone um, webinar. Uh, the information we received, as was expressed by Alejandro at the beginning, will feed in and help us to work on this um, report, the manual for policymakers when it comes to uh, managing e e EV integration. And I think this is, of course, uh, of great value to us, uh, what we received. Uh, and the third thing uh, I want to say before closing is uh, the next step. So uh, Luis and, and colleagues within Alejandro's stream, together with other colleagues, are now working on this uh, report. Uh, we plan to send it out for peer review uh, towards May, uh, June. And of course here, both the panelists, but also uh, participant attendees, we very much welcome your support uh, in reviewing this uh, report before it's being uh, released later in this year. And this comes back to the main point here that the work is to support policymakers with advice. And I think here, uh, in, again, with a comprehensive way of uh, uh, presenting the challenges, but also the opportunities, but also a number of uh, key areas where policymakers should focus on over the next years, uh, both when it comes to overcoming technical financial uh, barriers uh, is um, going to make this uh, report very important. Uh, and as, again, we have received many recommendations here as well on, on other ongoing work, and I think that is also very useful to make sure we build upon uh, the analysis already done. So thank you everyone for joining today uh, and have a, a great rest of the day and hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone.